Good evening, everyone. My name's Andre Spicer. I am the dean here at Bayes Business School. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight uh, to our wonderful school and for this fantastic uh, lecture, which we're going to have from Rosie, and it's going to be introduced by the Port Hill Trust. This morning, I thought I'd start with a small story. This morning, I was sitting up in my office, uh, enjoying a discussion and a coffee with one of our alumni. Uh, He's one of the first cohorts of graduates from one of our master's degrees, and he graduated, I think, over 40 years ago, um, so some time ago. And he went, went on then to a very, very successful business career. Um, our conversation ranged over a wide, wide range of topics, uh, including the history of the city, a stone mouse, apparently, which you can find somewhere if you look very, very hard, allegedly on Lombardy Street, or Lombard Street, uh, the trade in Venetian beads and the fact that you can find these in Alaska, which shows that there was European trade across the Bering Strait before Columbus, uh, and many, many other topics. So during this conversation, it's one of those rich conversations where you learn a great deal. So it's kind of uh, warmed my heart as a scholar, I guess. But then we stumbled onto the topic of redemption. He pointed out to me that redemption something which we often don't talk about, is a vital aspect of human life. And I happen to agree with him. Every single one of us in this room shares two things. One, we've all done things which are wrong, no matter what they are. Number two, we rely on our fellow human beings, our friends, our families, our lovers, and even strangers, to give us that redemption, to give us that shot at redemption, which Paul Simon talked about in his... his uh, wonderful record, Graceland. So just as we have done wrong, and our wrongs are various, our redemptions are also various. They can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from our beliefs, our practices, whether spiritual or not, giving, work, retreat. But one of those forms of redemption we're going to hear about tonight is exercise and uh, physical um, exercise, which I think many people find solace in a way of developing themselves and it gives them that shot at redemption. That's the serious bit. <laughs> now for the slightly uh, less serious bit. I, as a dean, I need to welcome you to my institution. Um, we are a world leading business school based in the city of London, if you haven't guessed. Um, our mission here is really about developing inquisitive professionals, professionals who go out and are willing to change business for the better. Now, some of you are probably thinking, I've wandered into a business school and I'm getting business jargon, business BS already, right? And that's what you would expect from a business school professor, I guess. But for us, these words aren't really just B BS. I think they're real. And I see that every day when I sit in my classroom, talk with my faculty. So tomorrow morning, I'm gonna go and sit with a bunch of undergraduate students from all across the world. In that group, I think there are more nationalities in the classroom than there are people. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience to be amongst people from all across the world. The second thing is that every person, uh, members of our faculty are deeply committed to building the professions of London, whether that's actuarial science, finance, entrepreneurship, and much more. Uh, we're a community of people, so when I speak with our, our MBA students, who are not notoriously known for being the most uh, kind-hearted folks sometimes, um, they, they say, why did you come here? And one, one phrase which really stuck with me is that well, we came to you because if we went to London Business School or Imperial, it's like going into the shark tank. Here, you're a bit more playful, like a pool of dolphins, they said. Um, I also am reminded by Caroline Averts, my deputy dean, that dolphins can be mean to each other sometimes too. <laughs> the the thir fourth thing we see is really important is a, a spirit of inquisitiveness, uh, kind of asking questions, and that's, that's related with our name, which I'll come back to soon. And we produce practical people. People are ready to go out there and change things and make change a reality. Now, I want to say a few words about the fact that, uh, with, along with the Portal Trust, um, who's the benefactor of tonight's event and the host of tonight's event, we too have changed our name. So on a mem morning in 2002, uh, 2020, I woke up, looked at the news, and there was a story about Sir John Cass um, and the, the statues being pulled down. And it, it pointed out that he was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, it shocked me uh, because when I arrived here, people said, oh, John Cass, he was involved in the War of the Roses, blah, 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 forget it. Uh, that's all I knew, and I conveniently forgot it. 
Um, but then I looked up in, in uh, the history of the Royal Africa Company, being a kind of nerdy academic, I had to look at the facts and data and indeed saw that he was playing a role there. This started off a long process of self-reflection, as with the Portal Trust, uh, asking questions and then leading to a name change in 2012. Uh, we decided to call ourselves Bayes Business School uh, because the Reverend Thomas Bayes is buried about 500 metres that way, but also because of his spirit and the idea of the Bayes theorem that you get closer to the truth by progressively updating your beliefs uh, dependent on the best quality evidence, or proportional to the best quality evidence. And this is something that we're building into all we do here. But a second part of this, I think, is our relationship, long relationship with the Portal Trust, which is vital to us. This building was built from a significant gift from the then Sir John Cass Foundation, five million pounds. Um, and uh, we've also continued to have a very strong relationship with the Portal Trust. Uh, One million pounds have been given to a collaborative mentoring scheme, which was supported by Richard Foley, um, uh, for undergraduate students who are working at four local schools and training them in mentoring. So not only improving their skills, but going out and working with many skills to improve, uh, schools to improve this pe the skills of people in those schools. Um, this is a credit-bearing course, and it gives these students coaching and counselling skills, particularly coaching skills, which they'll go on to reuse for the rest of their life. This grant was renewed in 2012 uh, to the tune of 135K, uh, and I'd like to thank Richard Foley and also Paul Palmer, I don't know if he's here, um, Professor Paul Palmer, for making a significant contribution and making this extremely innovative and interesting uh, thing happen, which has changed many young people's lives already. Now, the final thing I, that stands to me is to hand over to Sophie Fernandez and to ask her to introduce our fantastic speaker for the evening. So thank you and welcome to Bayes, and I look forward to the speech. Thank you, Andre, and thank you for hosting us this evening. Um, I'm going to be quick because you're not here to see me, you're here to see Rosie. And Rosie also wants you to network and speak and discuss about this afterwards. So, just very quickly to recap on the Portal Trust for you. These last few years have been an evolutionary journey that Andre uh, pointed to just now. We have and continue to evolve as a trust and as a board. And many of you in this room and watching online have been with us every step of the way as partners, advocates, and as supportive, guiding, and constructive friends and I'd like to say thank you once again for being there every step of the way with us. Some things don't change though. Our commitment to assisting young people aged five to 24 years old to realize their potential and creating a more equitable community, these things remain as steadfast as ever. This commitment has seen us award 16.5 million pounds in grants over the last 10 years. And you'll be pleased to hear I won't be listing them all tonight, but as a taster, this has ranged from young people in Peckham being supported in gaining access to the creative arts via projects such as Generation Next at Mount View, and young people across Hammersmith accessing the START programme, and our two London schools, the Aldgate School in the City of London and Stepney All Saints in Tower Hamlets. Through partnerships, we've helped set up bursary programmes at Cambridge, Oxford, Goldsmiths, the University of Westminster and London Metropolitan. And last year, with the support of the Unite Foundation and the University of London, we helped create a bursary scheme called A Home Away From Home. This guarantees young people who have experienced the care system a secure place to call home during their degree. Here I'd like to make a special mention to the young individuals we've also awarded grants to over the last 10 years, totalling over 3 million. This has helped fund courses as varied as astrophysics and urban dance studies, has facilitated 19 young people to gain their medical degrees, seven become engineers and four solicitors. The potential was already in these young people. They did all the hard work to succeed and we just opened the door for them. Speaking of potential and linked to tonight's lecture, we believe there is a large amount of untapped potential amongst prisoners. We are passionate about action and tangible outcomes in this area. That's why we have committed five million to in educational projects in the last 10 years, working with young people either in prison or recently released or in danger of entering the prison system. Working with the London College of Fashion, 
we have committed £2 million to a project working with female prisoners in His Majesty's Prison Downview to support the transition from prison to society. So tonight, I'm delighted to hear more about this area of education from Professor Rosie Meeks. A chartered psychologist and prison scholar, she joined Royal Holloway University in 2013 as head of department, and during her extended tenure as a senior leader, she established and led the Interdisciplinary School of Law. She works closely with parliamentarians to ensure that her research is effective in improving criminal justice, education, and health outcomes. And in between all of this, she also writes books on the subject as well. Highly recommended. Rosie believes that working with people in prison is one of the biggest challenges our society faces. And we believe this to be the same. So enough from me. It's Rosie and more about this that you've come to see and hear. I remind you of our hashtags for tonight, which is hashtag portal lecture uh, at portal underscore trust as well behind me. Feel free to tag us on social media um, and put online about this lecture. That's completely open. Afterwards, Rosie will be doing a QA and a uh, so get your questions ready. And thank you once again for being here tonight. It really is wonderful to be back here in person at Bayes. Thank you. The Portal Trust is here. To open a door to life-changing opportunities for London's youth. Funding, supporting and contributing to organisations with big ideas. For young people. Removing boundaries and helping us reach our potential. We can all achieve amazing things. Sometimes all we need is the opportunity. Change begins here. Find out how at portaltrust.org. Thanks, Sophie. I'm hoping my mic works all right. Someone's going to tell me if it isn't. Thank you so much to everyone at the Portal Trust for organising this. We got here in the end. Uh, and thanks to Bayes for hosting this evening. Um, and given the topic of the Portal Trust lecture is always about education, uh, I will just start my address by paying tribute to my mother, who's watching online, and um, it's the middle of lambing season, so she couldn't be here in person. Um, but she home-educated me. Um, I was a bit of a feral child, and formal education was definitely not for me. Uh, but she was creative, and she recognised that um, if I was going to get an education, I'd have to do it my way. So I'm here now, and I'm very grateful for that support. And also thanks to the University of Sussex, actually, because they took a bit of a chance on me when I applied with my two A-levels from uh, evening classes. They weren't particularly good A-levels because I was working full-time. Uh, but they saw potential in me, and um, again, I'm very grateful that they did. And the theme of seeing potential in people and being creative is, is really what I want to talk about <clears throat> today. And obviously, there's lots of people in this audience um, and joining us online, who I welcome, who have direct experience of working in prisons and have being incarcerated in prisons. And I'm particularly grateful that you're joining us. But even if you don't have experience of being in a prison, I think we can all um, probably conjure up quite how bleak these places can be. And I think you'll probably all be aware of the poor outcomes associated with people who have experience of incarceration around their education and their life trajectories. But I'm also acutely aware in my work as a forensic psychologist of the massive untapped potential in our prisons. So as an educator as well at Royal Holloway, who has direct experience of the transformative impact of learning, education really is a criminal justice priority for me. Now, when we look at the purposes of prison, we have some competing priorities, as my uh, students here in the audience will well know. Um, it is a given that prisons can be quite effective in detaining people, uh, depriving people of their liberty as a uh, form of punishment issued by the courts. And, of course, preventing people from offending uh, in the community whilst they're in custody. Research does show, though, that the deterrence element of prisons isn't particularly effective. When we impose harsher sentences, there is no direct correlation with a reduced crime rate. And then in terms of rehabilitating people, which is that 
final priority of a modern prison service. When reoffending rates remain as consistently high as they do, we know we're doing a pretty poor job at the moment. Now, as of last Friday, which is the most up-to-date statistics, we currently incarcerate just over 83,500 people in England and Wales. And together with Scotland, we have the highest incarceration rates in Western Europe. And at just 10 years of age, we incarcerate, we have one of the lowest ages of criminal responsibility in Western Europe, and in fact, in the whole world. We currently incarcerate, at the moment, around 500 children aged 18 and under, although 10 years ago, it was more like seven times that at 3,500. So we have seen a welcome reduction in, in child's incarceration, but we are still over-incarcerating children, often unnecessarily, in fact, most recent data just published this month from the Youth Justice Board confirms that a huge three quarters of all children on remand in custody received a non-custodial outcome when their, fi their case finally went to trial. But on average, these children were waiting seven long months between the alleged offence and completion at court. So as a starting point, there is a compelling case for sending fewer people to prison in the first place. Let me be clear about that investing more in diversion programs and community-based sentences, particularly for low-risk offenders and those convicted of non-violent offences. But for those who are detained in our prisons, we do need to be more creative and effective in meeting that rehabilitative aim of incarceration. And it will come to no surprise as anyone in this room that I think sport and physical activity has an important role to play here, a role that is often overlooked. So no, by no means am I naive enough to suggest that sport and physical activity is a cure-all, particularly given some of the really complex individuals that we have in our prison system. But I do strongly believe that there is capacity for a whole range of creative interventions in our prisons, and sports-based ones can, can play a big part there. Now, when I was undertaking my training in psychology at, back at Sussex University, I had a couple of profound experiences working and volunteering in criminal justice agencies. So I volunteered for a criminal justice charity called New Bridge, who have in fact been supported by the Portal Trust in the past. Another called Prisoners Abroad, who have a representative here today. And with Brighton Youth Offending Team. Later on, I supported my PhD studies through working with the Howard League for Penal Reform. Now, each of these experiences instilled in me, at the same time, a real sense of despair about the state of our prisons and a recognition that we could and should do more. So fast forward a few more decades, and I am still struck by the wasted potential of those individuals that I work with in prisons, both here and internationally. Tonight, of course, I'm focusing on children and young people in prison for whom Incarceration can be particularly damaging and re-traumatising. A recent report from His Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons found that a huge 89% of young people in prison had been excluded from school. Incarcerated children are also dramatically more likely to have been in the care system, while less than 1% of the general population has experience of local authority care. In contrast, over half of all children in prison do. And of course, it costs the taxpayer far more to send a child to prison than it would be to send them to Eton. So prison is expensive and it's not really working. On the whole, our prisons at the moment are overcrowded, under-resourced and understaffed. At the moment, we're seeing particularly high staff turnovers, with more than half of those who left the prison workforce last year having been in their role for under three years. There are also really high levels of staff absence, particularly in the youth estate, where the most recent figures that I found last week confirm that youth custody service staff had the highest sickness absence rate at 19 average working days lost per person per year. These operational challenges make it incredibly difficult for any prison to function effectively or safely. And I have great sympathy for the prison leaders who are in the room and joining us online today. There are also many educators in the room today, and we are all aware of the transformative effect of education, but we also know that education in our prisons is still woefully poor. We do have incredible individuals working in our prisons, 
of course, working in difficult and challenging circumstances with very little recognition or reward. And my work has led me to explore a whole range of issues in prisons, but the area where I have been given most hope and been inspired and humbled is in the area of sport and physical activity behind prison walls. Our failing prison system is partly propped up by an army of PEIs, physical education officers, who oversee the prison gym, that cornerstone of the prison, which is popular. It offers some normality and it can, with the right support, represent the start of positive journeys out of the justice system. So a particular welcome to those PEIs who are joining us tonight. I really salute you. So rather than bringing to mind this rather bleak prison exercise yard, like this one from a Victorian prison pretty close to here, actually, I want to relay the opportunities that can be realised through the fostering of positive relationships through sport. Something can be summed up a bit more like this in another prison. And to illustrate this, let me share two short quotes from some young men from London who I've worked with while they were in prison. The first told me, and these are typical quotes, behaviour-wise, when I was first sent down, I was always on basic, which is a form of punishment, for messing around. And then the PE department, they just kept me out of trouble, really. A second quote is from a participant on the very first sports-based programme that I evaluated, a legacy from the Ian Wright Football Behind Bars project. He told me, now I'm even considering going to university to do a foundation and then possibly doing physiotherapy. Before, I never had anything like that in my mind. There's an image from that very first Ian Wright football behind bars project. There's Ian in the centre. Uh, and I'm delighted to say one of the young men who worked uh, with me on that programme and Ian Wright 15 years ago is Adrian, pictured in the yellow jersey here, who went on to enjoy a successful career as a professional footballer and is joining us tonight. Welcome, Adrian. He also has established his own charitable foundation to support young people through sport, so I shall be encouraging him to speak to the Portal Trust about funding. <laughs> I've seen countless examples of hardworking and inspirational individuals using sport to engage and motivate children and adults, for whom other programmes and interventions are just not working. But this isn't just about promoting an individual's motivation, it's also about transferring lessons from this work to improving how we work in prison, recognising that it's the interpersonal relationships that are key. I can share a brief story here, which unfortunately is not an isolated incident. When recently I was in a youth prison speaking to boys who had been eligible to take part in a sporting initiative as an evaluation of that initiative that I was leading. It was early afternoon and when the cell was unlocked, the young man was fast asleep in his bed and the officer was not able to wake him. So I was a little concerned for his well-being and spoke to the wing staff. I was simply told, oh, he's our dream prisoner. He watches DVDs all night and he sleeps all day. We never have a peep from him. I asked when he was due for release and was told it was a matter of weeks after a substantial sentence. What does this say about the culture of a prison where success is a troubled young man who simply sleeps through his sentence? Any form of engagement would be better than that, be it arts, music, vocational skills, talking therapies, of course meaningful education, or just a supportive chat. But that requires res reliable, resilient, supportive staff. It requires a strong workforce and good leaders who promote positive values in our prisons. I've worked with children and young adults who benefit every day from the physical, of course, as well as the social and the psychological advantages of movement and exercise but also those who have found a passion for learning, for reading, for further study through their love of sport. Children who build confidence in their educational abilities through sport. Learners who have started to appreciate the value of studying towards vocational qualifications, perhaps to follow their dream of becoming a gym instructor, a personal trainer, a voluntary referee or a community coach. There is abundant psychological and educational evidence of the importance of play in healthy child development, particularly in working with those who have endured adverse childhood experiences, trauma and neglect, as we know is the case for so many people who are involved in our criminal justice system. There is strong evidence for supporting sports-based learning in prisons, not just in promoting 
education for those reluctant learners who have faced multiple exclusions or had really negative or disruptive experiences of formal education and who therefore enter prison with poor English and maths, but also in equipping learners in prison with a realistic route into employment, training and education, including opportunities through the prison gate into the community and into our thriving sports and fitness sectors. I'm going to show a one minute clip in a moment from a film that I made 11 years ago now in a young offenders institute where the young men who we hadn't prepared for this, we just pulled them off the rugby pitch and they spoke so eloquently and explained better than I could about the impact of this sports initiative on their learning trajectories. Um, on, the, on the academies, I've gone from segregation all the way up to enhance in a few months, so it's helped me in discipline with the staff and calm me down. It teaches people that do not always have to be angry around people. We get involved with the govs, so when we sort of get around and talk to people, it's a lot more easier to speak to the govs and get on with them, and they give us a bit of their time. They don't need to be here, but, you know, if they're doing it, it's a great experience, so. Well, me, myself, I'm an active person. If I haven't got anything to channel my energy and aggression into, I think I'd be a bit bored and uh, it's, good for, it's good for all around, isn't it? It's good for your mental health, your social skills. So it does, it improves a lot of things. As I'm from ADHD, I'm like, hyperactive and that, so normally if I'm in a classroom all day, like, I can get a bit, a bit impulsive and bored and that, and then that's when I start misbehaving and that. So when I start here, it's better because I get to run around and do things and like, I keep my mind stimulated as well. So. That's just a, a small extract from a film which is about 12 minutes long. It's available in full on um, YouTube. You just search Fit for Release and my name comes up. And I will pay tribute to James Mapstone and Justin Coleman who developed that programme um, in partnership with the RFU. And the model was later partially replicated by Saracens Rugby Club, who I understand have also received funding from the Portal Trust. Now, while I support a really diverse range of activities and my, I started with rugby because that's my true love, but all sports is, uh, is, is of interest to me. Um, let's just be clear that we need to be uh, focusing on a diverse range of activities to promote exercise to everyone, not just those traditional sporty types. But I'm not advocating boot camps, I do need to say that, because their boot camps are often used as a political cheap shot that routinely get touted as the next thing to cut youth crime. But in their recent evaluation of such initiatives, colleagues at the University of Cambridge have recently found that young people do not respond well to the discipline element of boot camps, and actually they led to no reduction in reoffending. But it comes as no surprise that the young participants did value the physical activity element. Now, I've had the privilege of helping to establish and evaluate a wide range of partnerships between prisons and sporting groups and bodies from various different table tennis clubs, Boxing England, um, Park Run, where we now have regular park runs in, in five Young Offenders Institute and dozens of adult prisons, local football and rugby clubs, rowing clubs, yoga practitioners, the list goes on. I'm really in awe of those prison educators who have recognised this opportunity and strive to embed learning in sport and sport in learning. I've seen some great examples of that over the youth estate. Uh, in particular, uh, Keith Potter and Michelle Glassop at Feltham Young Offenders Institute use sport really in so much of their work. They embed it in quite subtle ways um, where they're promoting education, making sure that the boys in their care are gaining qualifications and relevant experience whilst having fun and being physically active. And I don't know if you can see the bottom left there is an image um, that I took when I accompanied them on the Duke of Edinburgh uh, trip down onto Dartmoor for those prisoners who were eligible to be released on temporary license. But what is it about these various programmes that make them effective? And they are, because I've evaluated them as an independent evaluator and, and seen reductions in reoffending, reductions in intermediate outcomes that predict reoffending. Well, it is the physical element, but it's also the partnerships and the relationships and the opportunities that they offer the young people who take part and the alternative directions that they can inspire. So although promoting education is a significant feature of the potential of prison sports initiatives, in sports-based programmes with wraparound services, such as mentoring, which we've heard about this evening, and other support work, 
or any initiatives where sport is simply used as the hook for engaging individuals, actually the type of sport being utilised is not really of primary importance as long as it serves to motivate and capture the attention of those it targets. So in short, the success of any sports-based intervention may be as much or more determined by the strength of the non-sport components and the charisma, the experience and the engagement technique of delivery staff involved. I'm going to show on the screen in a moment a theory of change diagram, which I'm not expecting everyone to be able to read, but it will be replicated in the printed version of this talk, um, which depicts an overview of the mechanisms that are considered to be necessary when using sport as a means of reducing crime. With colleagues, I've tried to articulate here how desistance from crime can occur when initial contact with a sporting activity on the left leads to deeper, more involved engagement from, re from which relationships of trust and acceptance can be developed. This logic goes on to imply that these relationships provide a platform upon which individual development of a participant can be built and which may lead to further opportunities in education, in training and in employment. This model is illustrated well by the young man who told me recently that taking part in prison park run on a Saturday morning means he now has something positive to tell his mum when she visits and he's now motivated to improve his fitness. Or the prison gym officer who establishes so much of a rapport with the angry, angry young man who comes to his gym that he encourages him to enrol on a gym instructor qualification, his first ever qualification. Or the ex-prisoner who leaves prison and establishes their own charity supporting fellow ex-prisoners into education through sport. And the learner who was told he'd never amount to anything but was inspired to learn to read and write by a functional skills tutor who realised that she would have more luck engaging with those in her care by taking her classroom to the gym and bringing the gym into her classroom. And I'm thinking specifically here of a brilliant tutor that we worked with in Wandsworth Prison many years ago. And sadly, her role was cut in the prison's new education commissioning contract. Now, in 2012, over 10 years ago already, when the UK was gearing up to host the London Olympics, together with my colleague Nina Champion, who's here tonight, and other colleagues from Prisoners Education Trust, who have previously benefited from Portal Trust funding, we launched a report making the case for sports-based learning in prisons. Following this publication, which is also free to download, we received lots of correspondence with further testimonials from prison gym managers, from sporting bodies who had not previously been into prisons but wanted to, from currently serving prisoners who appreciated what we were saying and could identify with the stories we were telling, and from those with previous convictions. Amongst those was LJ Flanders, who in 2015 published his book Cell Workout, which he designed from his own prison cell, where he also became a qualified personal trainer. I'm delighted LJ is here today, and he now contributes to the training of new prison officers. Another book recommendation alongside LJ's is the biography of John McAvoy, who turned his life around through sport. He became a world record holder in rowing whilst serving a life sentence, attributing his success to the support of a forward-thinking member of prison staff, Darren Davis, who's joining us online tonight. Thank you, Darren, on behalf of everyone you've helped. Now, having read uh, my book, which I've got a few copies of, if anyone has a burning desire to have one, uh, which was published 10 years ago, uh, Dr. Philip Lee, who's in the audience, who was then the Under Secretary of State for Justice, um, asked me to carry out an independent review. I was given the opportunity to visit adult prisons, youth prisons, secure children's homes, secure training centres, all throughout England and Wales. I was given access to as much data as I wanted and had the opportunity to meet staff and residents across these facilities. I supplemented my uh, visits across the estate with collated written consultations with over 300 young people in prison and other key stakeholders. And the resulting publication, there's some copies here today, please take one if you'd like one, uh, culminated in a dozen recommendations. The report's also free to download, as is the accompanying government response to my 12 recommendations uh, where the government accepted all but one. Now one of my recommendations, which I'm glad to say they did accept, stressed the need for a women and girls strategy in promoting sport and physical activity 
in the prison estate. Despite representing only about 4% of the prison population, women and girls are also the least active group in prison, according to data that I managed to get hold of through freedom of information requests. That doesn't mean they don't want to benefit from the physical, the social and the psychological opportunities that physical activity offers. In fact, in my experience, which explored the barriers to women taking part in physical activity in prisons, young women told me about being forced to choose between telephoning their children or having a visit from their child or using the gym or not having access to any sports clothing or simply being offered a weights room which had been designed for male prisoners. Now, I've been working extensively with Bronzefield Women's Prison to consult with the women within that establishment on what physical activity they would engage in. And that's led us to offer a whole range of different activities, badminton, table tennis and boxing, each in partnership with the national governing bodies for those sports. And I'm really pleased we've got colleagues from Bronzefield here today. Now, in summing up, we have come some way in the 200 years that separate these two images. On the left, this image is from Brixton Prison, um, and it depicts the use of the treadmill, the original uh, word of the treadmill, which uh, was used simply as a punishment. It wasn't used for any rehabilitative aim whatsoever, but it was a form of, of punishment through movement. In direct contrast, exactly 200 years later, on the right, we have a group of children in prison during a communication and team building exercise led by a psychologist using the climbing wall. But these sorts of initiatives still remain unusual. We do still have a long way to go until we see initiatives like these being properly embedded in our prisons, even though we know they work. Lack of resource, lack of leadership and lack of investment means only a small percentage of people benefit from these opportunities. A great programme that goes into a prison and occasionally reaches 20 people in that prison of 400 is, after all, only reaching 5% of that prison. And although I don't claim it can resolve all the complex issues that our prisons and those that live and work in our prisons face, I do believe that making better use of sustainable sport and physical activity programmes can have far-reaching benefits for people in prison and the communities to which they will return. In my opinion, never has there been a more important time to consider the use of engaging, innovative and creative approaches such as these. Approaches that are aligned with renewed efforts to promote healthier and safer prisons. Now, what I welcome most about this evening's lecture is not just the opportunity to speak at you, although I have really enjoyed that, thank you for the invitation, but also the opportunity to stimulate some debate and discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. And over refreshments, I really would like you to speak to each other. There are representatives here from government, from sporting groups, from prisons, from criminal justice charities, and people with direct experience of being incarcerated who exemplify the importance of physical activity in prisons. So please do strike up conversations with someone you don't know, and perhaps we can see some new prison sports partnerships developed this evening. Thanks again for the invitation. Well, thank you so much, Rosie. That was fascinating. And um, as you've already mentioned, um, in the audience, we have politicians, prisoners, uh, prison system educators, people who work in sports, health, um, youth justice system and in training. So I think we should um, get some really fascinating questions, I think, this evening. We have 20 minutes for questions. Um, and as Rosie said, um, after that, you can carry on your questions um, with her outside in the, um, with the refreshment. So we'll get on with it, shall you? I think one of the questions I think that somebody might ask you is, what was the um, recommendation that was turned down? <laughs> that was bound to come up, so I've turned that off. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, the recommendation that was turned down, I'm looking to my colleague, Philip Lee, because he uh, went through this pain with me, was one where I was recommending that the current ban on anything to do with martial arts and boxing should be reconsidered and that decision should fall in the hands of a prison governor 
whether or not they thought martial arts programmes should be permitted in their prison. As it stands, Tai Chi, self-defence for women, anything boxing related isn't permitted. So I should stress the image that I showed where we have a partnership developing with England Boxing is a completely non-contact, no pad work because that's not allowed. Um, so yeah, that's the one which I'm still fighting away on. <laughs> Brilliant, okay. All right, in case uh, I didn't introduce myself, I'm Denise Jones, I'm the chair of the Portal Trust Grants Committee and deputy chair of the Portal Trust, which is why I'm sitting here. And um, I'm going to take your questions. If we take two questions at a time, and somebody has a microphone, I think they'll bring up back there. Um, so if you could just, in can you just indicate now if you think you're going to ask a question so we can get an idea of where they all are? Okay, that's brilliant. All right, should, well, should we start with Speaking this? Who they are as well. Yes, if you stand up, if, well, sorry, if you say who you are, you don't need to stand up. Um, and then ask you. Hello, question. Lord Addington. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm Liberal Democrat peer and also president of the British Snakes Association. The very low educational attainments which go through the entire prison system are something which stop people getting qualification, you know, qualifications and making them ready for work. What would, could you say a little about the relationship between some form of good sporting experience and the uh, relationship to actually being able to actually engage in education? We take two at a time? Yes, two at a time. Um, is there one on this side? I think there was one at the back. Yeah. Okay, here. I was wondering what you might have as your scenarios for the future. I mean, in a sense, what you said sounds fantastic. Um, so what would be your optimistic scenario for, let's say, five years out? What would be your kind of best guess at what's going to happen? And heaven forbid, what would be your sort of worst case scenario for what might happen over the next five years in this area? Great question. I'll start with that if I may, then I'll come to Lord Addington. So my best case scenario is that we see sport and physical activity embedded across prison. At the moment, it's all too often seen as a responsibility for the gym staff only. And as I've talked about tonight, there should be more partnerships with education staff, but also with healthcare staff. There's a lot to be gained by partnering with healthcare staff, psychological services and so on. Anyone who works in a prison knows that those different departments tend to operate incredibly siloed fashion. So I'd like to see more collaborative working across those departments using sport and physical activity at their core. That's the best case scenario. Um, the sort of moderate scenario is things will just stay as they are. Worst case scenario is we are seeing a reduction in the number of PEIs, those physical education instructors that I talked about. And to prefer, prepare for this this week, I did get the most up-to-date statistics, and we've seen a drop this now in the region of 600, where, whereas there were 700 last year and more than that year before. So seeing a reduction in those PE instructors who work in our prisons is a real concern for me because these are people who work across the prison. They have great relationships with the, with the people in their care. So thanks for that question. Lord Addington's question about um, how you might relate from being a, a good sports person into a learner. If I interpret that right correctly. Well, we, this is what we see. We see people learning lessons on the pitch, which they can take off the pitch. And simply motivating people, actually, is incredibly powerful by saying, now that you've found that you love playing football or rugby or whatever it is, and you've found something that you're good at and that you're passionate about, let's do a little bit of education that makes sense to you in that context, and you might end up being able to work in this field or being able to volunteer in this field. So we see motivation levels increase dramatically, Obviously, as I think you're alluding to, there is some pretty strong educational needs in this context, and that's why I keep talking about the requirement to have really good staff supporting those initiatives. We have some brilliant schemes where we offer uh, prisoners the opportunity to teach fellow prisoners how to read, for example, but we shouldn't be relying on that. Um, we do need better resource, and we need to integrate those. It's a little bit like the answer to the gentleman's question previously. We need to integrate those sorts of techniques so that education is working better with the sports in, in each prison. Thanks, Rosie. Are there any questions in the middle? Do we take anybody in the middle? Um, the, the woman at the back. Hi, Rosie. Uh, Nina Champion, uh, Director of the Criminal Justice Alliance, um, and I wrote the Fit for Release report with Rosie. I just want to... I was interested in what you were saying about, you know, things about Park Run and these... Um, some different interventions 
and the importance of not just seeing sports within the prison, but actually as a bridge through the prison gate, you know, back into society and how important it is, you know, with sports in terms of those connecting back into the community. And have you seen good examples of where it's not just happened in prison, but it's also been able to support people sort of through the gate? And another question. Um, I can't see any hands. OK, yes. Um, actually, potentially um, the other end of that is, is I wonder if, if your research indicates anything or even just your gut feel on in terms of you're talking about the reoffending rates but how about the preventative before it happens you know is there anything about the principles of it which would apply to preventing it in the first place or or is this very specific to the prison environment right i'll start with that i actually had a long section in my talk about that and then i took it out because i was worried about time um and actually historically that is where the research attention has been directed when it comes to sports and criminal justice it's been focusing on the diversion element, which there is a bigger body of work there, and there's a well-recognised um, correlation between using sport and diverting people out of the criminal justice system. Um, and I, there will be some suggested readings for that in my report for those that are interested in that. And, and then in terms of Nina's question, yeah, that is where really all my research attention is going now. I think there's a lot to be said for short-term programmes that come into prisons and make prisons more bearable, frankly. But I strongly believe that we should be having through-the-gate elements in all of these programmes. And I briefly mentioned um, before the slide went, in my last slide, my, some of my students who I'm working with on this. And, and one in particular, Lisa Edmondson, is working with me on the park run evaluation, where we're doing exactly that. We're looking at how many people continue and want to enter the community park run um, environment when they come out of prison and how much that habit when in prison has influenced their lives post-release or not, of course. I mean, anyone who's done research with uh, people in prison knows how difficult it can be to track people when they come out. But we have some great resource in this country. We have the Justice Data Lab in the Ministry of Justice, which other countries are very envious of, where we can track people and, for any statisticians in the room, use propensity score matching to see the likelihood of them reoffending and whether that intervention was successful or not. So we do have some great resource there to look at the longer-term impact, and that is something that I'm very much committed to. Right. Okay. Okay. Jenny. Pardon? Can I wait for the mic or shall I just... Shout? Oh, we wait for the mic. Yes, please. And one other. Who's another one after that? Okay. Shall I start? Yeah. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. And, and you know, as a governor of the Portal Trust, we're, we're very much in support of prisoner education of all kinds. Um, my question is about um, the relatively low number of women who are in our prisons, uh, prisons and whether you find it more or less difficult to obtain support uh, for your programmes. For women. For women. Okay, and the gentleman over here. The blue shirt. Uh, Andrew Harlan from the Worshipful Company of Educators. Um, I um, have loved sport, and one of the things I've done over the years is I became a, a coach. So I'm a, a tennis, badminton, and squash coach, and that got me into various jobs. However, I was interested in, partly linked to a comment you made earlier, about what's the rhetoric or support from the sporting bodies to support um, people in prisons because, as you've just said, there's a shortage of people in there, so why can't people be trained to, be, to train their fellow, fellow uh, prisoners? And that would save an awful lot of resource. So that's my question. Great questions. So in terms of women and girls, yeah, as I said, they are the least active group in our prisons. But actually when we go, and I think that's simply because they haven't been offered the types of activities that appeal to them. So a lot of my work's been around consulting with women and girls, and when we've then offered a more diverse range of activities, the uptake's been great. So that's why I mentioned we've got colleagues here from Bronzefield Prison where there's a great wellbeing manager there whose role is really about encouraging women to be active um, and offer a, a much more diverse range of activities. Um, and, our, and we've got great examples of women who have become qualified personal trainers when they've been in prison and have come out and gone into careers in that, um, as well as simply being healthier because they're more physically active. 
Um, and then the question here about um, governing bodies is a really important one because in the last 15 years when I've been doing this research, that's where I think I've seen some of the most progress. Initially, there was a real reluctance for sporting groups and bodies to go into prisons. And now they are incredibly keen. And I do pay tribute to people like Tim Hollingsworth at Sport England, who is very much encouraging sporting groups to come into criminal justice settings. Um, at the same time, we need to make sure these people are suitably qualified and supported to do that role. And in reverse, when we're talking <coughs> about training people up to become coaches, be reassured, we do risk assess those. So we're not going to equip someone with a certain offence to become a, a qualified coach. Um, if that's not appropriate. Um, but yeah, there's also been some great examples of, of prisoners training fellow prisoners and indeed staff members as part of their practice for their qualification. And in every prison gym, we have what are called gym orderlies, which are currently serving prisoners who are supporting the, the gym staff. And that is, by and large, one of the most popular jobs in a prison, to be the gym orderly. So it's an incredibly uh, rich resource, which we are using to some extent, but as, as you can tell from my talk, not enough. It's a good question, thank you. Mm. Rosie, can I just press you a little bit on the women's prison facilities? Because I think you mentioned that sometimes they're um, using equipment that perhaps was um, male, kind of... Yeah. Uh, dominant, not dominated, but, you know... Design. Um, design, well, design. Yes, in yeah. fact, the prison estate is very much designed by men for men. Mm. And there's a lot of work to be done to make women's prisons more appropriate. I'm looking at Philip again because we had <laughs> ambitions to develop women's centres under Philip Remit, which have kind of been abandoned. And instead we're seeing 500 new places for, for women in prison, which is not what any of us want or support. But yeah, a lot of those prison gyms are designed for men and there are different needs there. And in fact, some of the most alarming findings from my review was going into children's facilities where boys and girls are held together and PE consisted of the, the girls watching the boys doing football. I'm glad to say in the five years since my review, I've seen great improvements in that and girls being offered a much more diverse range of activities mm. to encourage them to be physically active because they ultimately will and can benefit from that. But it does partly reflect what we see in community, which is that physical activity levels do drop off amongst girls at secondary school age and we need to be doing something about that also. Yeah, OK. Okay, um, okay, gentleman here and um, Dave at the back. Uh, can I say thank you again um, for your report, having commissioned you, Rosie. It was uh, it took a long time to get you um, to be able to have you to do that. I mean, the, the resistance internally in the department, but polit uh, political political resistance was significant from the then Secretary of State who I won't name. Um, uh, she, she went on to be a fantastic Prime Minister for a few weeks. Um, <laughs> and, and, but I remember at the time, I, 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 the boxing, the thing you alluded to, the, the thing that was um, rejected at the time, it was deeply frustrating because we knew, particularly in the community, that mm. boxing, amateur boxing clubs, were really successful. Um, at um, stopping people from going into crime. I can remember meeting young people who just kept pointing to the boxing club as being the reason. And I just wonder, is, is there any work that needs to be done, commissioned, about the impact of particular sports in particular communities, cricket in the Pakistani community, um, for example, to try to build up a body of evidence? Because ultimately, what I remember was it took me six months to have the first meeting about this in the MOJ. And then once we had the first meeting, the ball started rolling and we brought you in and the rest is history. But it was just getting some evidence which fellow ministers or officials at HMPPS or whatever could not ignore. And I just wonder, what would you commission now? Which sports, which area, you know, in order to try to set the ball rolling again? Yes, it takes at the back. Hi, um, my name's Natasha Cox, and I'm a recent graduate from Bayes Business School uh, in January. Um, I did an MA in Innovation, Creativity and Leadership, and my master's uh, dissertation was in um, can the arts have an impact on the well-being and mental health 
of black boys and if so can it be sustainable so I'm at the place now where I've got a dissertation all of this research and I know it's the arts and you do the sports but how how can I progress from having a dissertation all this information into turning this into a play a forum theatre play that I'd like to tour into schools to help maybe some of the work that you do and everyone else in this room thank you questions okay do those two and then i'll okay. take the other person I'll, I'll that one. um the arts alliance is a great organization and nina behind you will be able to put you in touch with them um <laughs> they will be really interested in your dissertation that's my quick answer but i'm also happy to talk to you further thank you um and philip yeah okay so with the boxing we know there's actually decent evidence now in the community um and we set that out clearly when we were making the case for the recommendation um and one of the bits of work I'm enjoying most at the moment is working with England Boxing. It's no coincidence that their clubs in the community are based in some of the most deprived areas in the community. They're incredibly effective at working um, with, with diverse populations and depri deprived populations who wouldn't engage in other forms of physical activity. And we've all met people who say boxing has saved them. Um, the frustration was I was asking if I could just do a pilot programme and then evaluate it, and I was told no. Um, but what we are doing, as I've already mentioned, is linking people who are already in prison up with their local community boxing club for when they come out, making those introductions, building up that trust and that rapport, so that they've got a direct route when they come out to a club that is also getting support. And I do pay uh, tribute to England uh, Boxing here. They're training people up to work specifically with people in the criminal justice system. So I'm evaluating that at the moment. I'm really excited to see the long-term impact of that, of how, how that will support people, even if they're not getting the direct um, boxing programmes whilst they're in prison. Just as a side note, we also know that these boxing programmes are really appealing to the large proportion of people we have in prison from gypsy traveller backgrounds. Whilst um, Ashfield Young Offenders Institute was privately run and still a juvenile establishment, they were allowed to do some boxing there. And I'll tell this story because it is important. They told um, the boys in the prison, if you want to come and do the boxing programme, you have to have 100% attendance at education. And dramatically, education attendance improved for the Gypsy Traveller boys that they were targeting. Um, I'll just give that as one example of how important, as you can see, I'm still feeling quite passionate about the boxing <laughs> angle. Um, but you were right to pick up on cricket as well. Um, Andy's here, who, who used to work at, at Cricket for Change, now the Change Foundation. And we did some great work taking cricket into Belmarsh Prison to work in the populations there. And we do need to be more creative. But as I said, one of the things I'm most encouraged by is the fact that we do have national governing bodies and sporting bodies wanting to support our work. What we're not seeing enough of is leadership in HMPPS who are coordinating that. Are you, a, are you a professional boxer yourself? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I enjoy, it. I enjoy just, getting your punch bag. Okay, and just to add to our list of Portal Trust funds, um, we have been funding the um, Gypsy Traveller community in a primary school just, just recently as well, just to let you know. Um, okay, so David, I'll take your question and then one other after that. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Firstly, uh, Rosie, thank you very much for this evening. It's been fascinating. Um, I'm uh, Dave Chesterton. I'm a local uh, youth court magistrate. In the course of the last 30 years, I've visited custodial facilities for children across this country and Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, I visit the ones in Europe in particular um, have, on the face of it, significantly better outcomes than we do in this country uh, in terms of um, com com committing further offences on release. And I'm wondering whether or not you have been able to do any work looking at what it is that they're doing in the rest of Europe, particularly Western Europe, um, that we might learn from in this country. And I realise that's not fashionable at the moment, um, but I uh, would be interested to hear your answer. Thank you for that question. Um, any one other? Oh, Kevin, sorry, I've got you. Kevin Everett, Treasurer and Chairman Emeritus of the Portal Trust. My question, Rosie, and thank you very much for an inspiring talk to the audience tonight. Sorry. Um, my question is, if you were to ask the Portal Trust to consider funding a gap in prisoner education, sport or otherwise, what would it be? Um, okay, in terms of Europe comparisons, yeah, there are, I mean, we've got to remember we all measure our real 
reoffending data in quite different ways. I mean, Dominic Raab was saying recently we've seen a drop in reoffending. I don't think we have. We've just seen a change in how we measure it. Um, so we do have to be cautious in, in terms of how we um, compare countries. But also, I refer you back to the beginning of my talk where I mentioned we have one of the youngest ages of criminal responsibility in the world, indeed, in Western Europe. So we have the, the, wet, the, the net widening is greater in England and Wales than it is elsewhere. Um, but there are some good examples of, of diversionary um, approaches, which I'm happy to talk to you more about. Um, and your question, sorry, remind me what your question was about. If there was a gap. That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the key thing is that, uh, as I mentioned in response to <coughs> Nina's question earlier, we need sustainable through the gate programs. We are all aware of some great short-term flash-in-the-pan initiatives that come into a prison, work really well with a handful of people and then disappear. And, and we need system change. We need to see, um, and it's a million dollar question, how, how we sort that out. But it can't be done for a quick fix, is what I'm saying. It, it needs to be done carefully designed and put the, the child, and we're talking about children and young people here, at the centre of that. Um, and think about their journeys coming out of prison, not just what they'll be doing whilst they're in prison. Mm. Good. Okay, our time is almost up, so two more quick questions. If anybody who is dying to ask a question that I haven't noticed, um, there's one, where? Oh, I'm, I'm there's, there's there. One well, at the back, three. there's Can three. Okay, let's have three all together. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, was there anybody on this side that no, I'm missing? No. Nope. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Adrian Clifton. Um, one of Rosie's beneficiaries from one of her reports. Um, I wanted to ask a question. It's quite a short question. Um, is there any evidence that supports lived experience projects um, are more successful or just successful in these prison systems? Yeah. Shall I answer that question? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Great question, Adrian. And I'm glad you're sitting next to Nina because she can confirm there is. Mm. Um, although a lot of it is anecdotal, but yeah, I'm really glad you raised it because there's a huge resource there that isn't being used. And people like Nina Champion at the Criminal Justice Alliance are doing amazing work to use that resource. Um, so yeah, it's something that I think we all need to think about is how we can support people with lived experience to, to contribute in that way, to set up their own uh, programs of work because they know what works. And of course, when we go, when people with lived experience go back into prison, people in prison are much more likely to engage and believe their stories because they've walked in their shoes. So thanks for raising that. Thanks for being here. Okay. Um, can we go to Andrew? Mm -hmm. Hi, Andrew. You've got the mic coming over your right shoulder. Hey, Rosie. And yeah, thanks. Brilliant, brilliant presentation. Um, Andy Dolby Welsh from London Youth Games and board member for the Sport for Development Coalition. Um, probably from what Philip started off with saying, probably gives me an indication to answer this question, but it's really asking for a sense of how much of this is still an attitudinal battle from where you started your presentation between people's decision makers' belief on rehabilitation or punishment and how much of a battle have we still got to win with decision makers, change attitudes so that all of what you've said gets the support that it deserves. It's a really good question to end on, or nearly end on, because that is still the question which frames so much of what we do in prison work and in trying to reform prison programmes, because ultimately so many people still believe that prison is just simply punishment and that a lot of my work is about showing people that these positive programmes that we develop um, are leading to safer communities and are making it less likely that people are going to be victims of crime. And I think that's really important. Otherwise, I have people coming up to me and saying, well, my son behaved really well. Why doesn't he get to work with Ian Wright? And things like that. So um, there's work to be done now, I think, in, in showing the public about the value of these sorts of work. And then that becomes much more political. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've really answered that question. And in terms of that question, who are the main decision makers that we have to lobby? Um, well, as I've already alluded to, we've got sort of MOJ and HMPPS, leaders within HMPPS. But we also, I think, still need to see, as I mentioned earlier in response to the previous question, better working across departments in prisons. <laughs> still, we have people operating in isolation, and that's just how prisons are structured, I'm afraid, that the healthcare team don't talk to the education team okay. or to the psychology team or to the people in the gym. Mm. 
Okay, and the last person was someone over here. Hi, um, Dr. Ella Simpson, University of Greenwich. Thank you so much. Really interesting talk. Um, and as you may remember, so I research creative arts, sicky creative writing in prisons. Um, and I was really interested to see that we've come to some of the same conclusions in terms of I went into my research thinking the arts were the thing and I came out thinking the relationship is the thing and, and you sort of um, reaffirm that in terms of sports. So I wonder if you could just say a bit more about those relationships and particularly in terms of the facilitators. So you were talking about this charismatic uh, kind of quality. Could you just speak a bit more to that? Thanks, Ella. It's good to see you. And I absolutely agree. There's some really strong parallels between this body of work and that around arts um, in mm. prison. And yeah, as you said, there's some. The, the key thing there is around relationships and building up trust and rapport. And, and let's remember, a lot of these young people we work with in prison have been let down time and time again by adults in their lives. And so there's two twofold response to that. Firstly, we need to make sure we're not reinforcing that message that adults let them down. So I say this to people who are bringing sports programmes into prisons. If you say you're going to be there on a Tuesday morning, you have to be there come what may. Um, and secondly, when you don't let them down and you do what you say you're going to do and they have fun and they're physically active, you have an incredible learning moment at that opportunity, an incredible opportunity to instil all sorts of ideas in a positive direction. And I don't think we're doing enough to, for, better, for want of a better word, exploit that learning opportunity. Thank you. That's the end of the questions. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for those great questions. I think we could actually probably carry on for another 20 minutes, but um, you can carry on outside um, in, during the refreshment um, with Rosie. And I'm just going to hand over now to Professor Elizabeth Hill, who's the Deputy President of City of London University, uh, for the vote of thanks. Um, I don't know. You can stay there if you like. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rosie. Um, and good evening, everyone. So my name is Professor Elizabeth Hill, and I'm Deputy President at City University of London. I joined City in September, so I know I haven't met all of the City-based people here yet, um, but at some point, I hope I will have the pleasure of meeting you all individually um, and seeing and hearing a bit more about how the roles that you play here make such a positive contribution to society. I've already learned a lot, but I know there's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm very pleased to be here at Bayes Business School tonight to deliver the closing address for this event. And I'd first like to thank Rosie uh, for her inspiring and wide-ranging lecture. I personally found it fascinating, as my own research, although it's in a different context, focuses on the criticality of physical activity and coordination on cognitive development, educational achievement and employment particularly for people with uh, neurodiverse backgrounds. So lots of what you've said really resonates with that. One thing prisons and universities have in common is a shared desire to see people depart with greater self-belief and social skills than they had upon arrival. So it was really interesting to hear you talk, Rosie, about the benefits of sport being not necessarily the physical activity, but the relationship building, the ro role models, and the improved sense of self. Similarly, at City, we strive not only to educate, but to facilitate our students to grow as individuals in a safe and supportive environment. We hope that studying here can lead to a transformational outcome for all our students, but the spark for those outcomes may not necessarily come from traditional teaching. We aim to give our students' community a range of experiences to gradually realise the type of person they want to be beyond the classroom and beyond our institution. Our talented academic staff aim not only to teach, but as Andre said earlier, to influence and to stimulate. So many of us, when we think back to the formative years of our lives, will remember the inspirational individuals who showed us pathways we hadn't previously considered. So Rosie, thank you for being here this evening and for sharing your expertise with us. So I'd now like to thank our friends at the Portal Trust all along here. We have a long-standing relationship uh, with the Trust, as you know, who provide funding for our school's mentoring program. We thank them for this, as well as their continued support of the university and of Bayes Business School. 
We look forward to this relationship continuing for years to come and many more evenings like this one. So thank you as well. And just before we move outside for drinks and networking and all those conversations that Rosie wants us to have, I would just like to welcome Richard Foley to the stage, Chief Executive of the Portal Trust. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we conclude with the formalities for this evening, I'd like to say that the Portal Trust will be conducting a survey and we will be asking those who've attended here this evening or online for your opinions. These can be uh, expressed anonymously, you're pleased to hear. Um, so please uh, either scan the QR code that you'll find on the sheets uh, on your seats, uh, setting out the details for this evening's events, or look out for an email uh, in the next day or so. Uh, the views expressed will hopefully help us co to continue to improve this annual event. Um, we very much hope that that's, uh, this, this event continues to be very successful. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, announce officially that the accomplished actress, singer, presenter, author and politician, Baroness Fluella Benjamin, has very kindly agreed to deliver the third Portal Trust Education Lecture in this auditorium in November 2023. So thank you again for attending. We would be pleased if you were able to attend the reception and to carry on the conversation and to network with colleagues. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.